Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Joe's Journal. My name is Joe Tilden, and I'm the host of this program. Well, we're in the month of February, and February commemorates both what is great about America and also what is very shameful about America. As many of you know, uh, February is Black History Month. But first of all, let's talk about what's great about America. This month, we celebrate the birthday of two of our greatest presidents. First of all, George Washington, the father of the country. As you know, you read your history books, George Washington uh, from Virginia, the first commander of the Continental Army, and he led a very bedragged group of uh, combination militia, not, not really a professional army, but one that he had to hold together through many, many setbacks. And he had to believe that what they were doing was the right thing to gain independence uh, from Great Britain. And he had to convince his troops that the agony and, and uh, the suffering and the setbacks that they were going through, that in the end it would all be worth it. And of course, you know, he persevered. And with the help of our French allies at the time, the war was won, the Battle of Yorktown, when General Cornwallis surrendered, and, and the fighting part was over. The war actually ended two years later with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. But George Washington's uh, service to the country continued. You know, when he was commander of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War, uh, everything wasn't all smooth. Within his own army, he had some of his generals that uh, were inclined to revolt against his command. Uh, one of them was a, was a General Lee, a fellow Virginian. Light Horse Harry Lee, he was called. And he kind of questioned Washington's ability to be supreme commander. And there was another general, Horatio Gates, uh, who commanded our troops at Saratoga. Actually, the Battle of Saratoga was won because of the military ability of one Benedict Arnold, who could have been a great American hero, but has gone uh, down in history as a great American traitor. It was George Washington who presided over the Constitutional Convention that pulled together the document that is still the law of the land. And it was George Washington who served as our first president and who moved our capital from New York to Philadelphia to his present location on the swamp lands along the uh, Potomac River. And of course, that's where the our national capital, since it was regarded as halfway between what was then the United States, the 13 colonies, and that was uh, selected as the site to be our capital, which was named after our first president, our founder, uh, George Washington, and of course the whole district is called the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia. Our national anthem for a number of years was Columbia, the gem of the ocean. And of course, that was replaced by our current national anthem around 1931, when the Star Spangled Banner became our official national anthem. Well, the other great American that we commemorate this month, of course, is Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. Abraham Lincoln was probably our most intelligent president. This was a man that never graduated from grade school or high school or college or had any, any kind of a degree at all. But he educated himself through reading and studying and research on his own. He managed to study for the bar in the state of Illinois, passed the bar to become a lawyer. He was served in the uh, Illinois militia fought in a couple of Indian wars. He also served one term in Congress, 1846 to 1848, when he ran for re-election, he was defeated. His second bid in politics was to go to the U.S. Senate, 1858, and he ran against a man from Brandon, Vermont, who had relocated to Illinois by the name of Stephen Douglas. And the Douglas-Lincoln debates had a far-reaching effect. The big thing, of course, was slavery. 
the item of slavery was coming to a head. And both Douglas and Mr. Lincoln stated their views on this uh, incident. The result was that Stephen Douglas was elected to the Senate. But because of his views on slavery, it caught the, na the national attention, and particularly the intention of a new formed political party called the Republican Party. The Republican Party, of course, had been organized in 1854 in the state of Michigan. And the first candidate for president, um, and you know, I'm having a senior moment, it escapes my mind, but uh, the first candidate for president ran in 1856 and he lost to James Buchanan. In 1860, it was a wide field of Republicans seeking the nomination. The favorite was the uh, Secretary of State from, or the then Governor of New York State, William Seward. But for whatever reason, after a series of ballots, the name that came out front was that of Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. And he was the eventual nominee. He was not a unanimous choice but he did have enough uh, votes to become the nominee. His views were known by this time, were known nationwide, the fact that he wanted to preserve the Union and that he was opposed to what the South called a special institution, which we know as, the, as slavery. Well, of course, as you know, Lincoln went into Washington uh, sworn in his first term. He took the presidency at a time when the Civil War was underway. South Carolina had already seceded and fired on Fort Sumter and would soon be followed by a number of other southern states who would organize at a convention in Alabama and would create the Confederate States of America and they would select as their president Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. Jefferson Davis had been the Secretary of War, served in, uh, in President Pierce's cabinet, President Buchanan's cabinet at the start. He served in the U.S. Senate, a senator from Mississippi. And uh, he was the choice of the Confederate States to be their president as they sought to create a new nation which would protect the institution of slavery. So we commemorate Washington, we commemorate Lincoln, Lincoln the first president to be assassinated, shot by a Confederate sympathizer right after the end of the Civil War, John Wilkes Booth, and went down as, in the eyes of the Union, as a martyred president. There was no love for Lincoln in the South, of course, in the Confederacy. Well, on the downside of this month, it's also Black History Month. And I say on the downside because it's a month when we look at the horrors of slavery. When we talk about the glories of America, we talk about the people who came here seeking freedom. But the ancestors of our African Americans did not come here seeking freedom. In fact, they came here against their will, bound in chains and fetters and brought over on slave ships. There were people who had been captured in battles in Africa and then sold by the victors to what were known as slave traders in those days. And these men paid so much for the slaves, throw them in, in unsanitary ships and conditions, many of them died on the way over. And their bodies, if they were removed at all, they were thrown overboard. Many of them were not removed until after the uh, slave ships had docked in the U.S. and those that were still alive were brought out and were auctioned off like pieces of property. A very, very, very shameful chapter of American history. We talked about the land of the free and the home of the brave. But for many of our African-American ancestors, the original ones that came here, it was anything but. 
slavery, a huge, huge black mark on our history and still continues to be. Well, it would take a civil war to bring this so-called special institution to an end, at least officially to an end. And it would take the Union occupation of the old Confederate states to enforce it. When Rutherford B. Hayes became president in 1876, he ended the Union occupation of the southern states. And the result was that even though slavery was officially over, the torment of our African-American brothers and sisters had resumed again. A former Confederate general by the name of Nathan Forrest formed the Ku Klux Klan. These were people who didn't have the backbone to show their faces, but ran around dressed in white robes, sheets, hoods over their head. With the end of Union occupation of the Confederacy, many state legislatures in the South passed what they called Jim Crow laws. Lynching became an everyday occurrence. People felt that an individual African American was exerting himself too much or whatever, doing what was his right. He usually wound up on the end of a rope. And even up into our modern times, the Ku Klux Klan, much reduced from what it was, but still very active, has sort of had a rebirth under our current president. There are a number of southern states that have passed laws, and, and even some in the north, restricting the right to vote. As a result of the Civil War, one of the big amendments that Lincoln pushed through, first of all, we had the Emancipation Proclamation, which liberated all people held in human bondage in the states in rebellion. And following the end of the Civil War, Lincoln had pushed for the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States and in all of its territories. <clears throat> the reason the Emancipation Proclamation only liberated uh, slaves in the states in rebellion and because there were some fringe states that stayed in the Union that had slavery. Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri and Kansas, which were fringe states, all had legalized slavery. But with the coming of the 13th Amendment, <clears throat> that officially ended slavery all over the United States and all over its territories. And with the passage of the 15th Amendment, Every male in this country had the right to vote. They could not be discriminated against when it came to voting due to the color of their skin or their religious beliefs or their political affiliations or beliefs. It's interesting to note with the passage of the 15th Amendment, that's something we'll discuss later. Female suffrage which was on the rise with the Civil War and the end of the Civil War, had been a strong supporter of the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. They were not strong supporters of the 15th Amendment, which gave all men the right to vote. The simple reason was that it gave men the right to vote, but it still deprived the right to vote to women. And that didn't come in until the 19th Amendment passed in 1920. So this year, 2020, it'll mark the 100th anniversary of female suffrage when they had the right to vote, the right to hold property, the right to be considered as citizens. And of course, you know, there have been huge advancements in uh, women's suffrage over the years. <laughs> and you have women serving as a, in their Senate. 
And I think probably within another four years, we'll probably have a female president. So women's suffrage has come a long way in 100 years, and it's too bad it had to take 100 years to get this far. But um, that's one of the things we, we commemorate the month of February, our glory and our shame. Our glory and our shame. Some of the great leaders of the African-American people that sort of get bypassed a little bit. Frederick Douglass, who was a great abolitionist and campaigned very strongly for the end of slavery. Harriet Tobin, who was a major historical figure on the Underground Railroad, the number of slaves she helped liberate and helped them on their way to not only escape to northern states, but also many into Canada, where they were guaranteed that they wouldn't be sold back into slavery. John Brown, from northern New York State. John Brown um, was a white man, but he was a very, very strong supporter of the end of slavery. And, you know, he and his sons, of course, they, they uh, I don't know what you would say, they, they got involved in military action in Kansas. They were a part of the term in Kansas known as Bloody Kansas, when free men fought against slaveholders to determine whether that state should remain free or slave. John Brown, of course, came up with the idea of liberating all slaves. And he and his group, of course, captured Harper's Ferry in Virginia, which was a huge federal arsenal. And it's ironical that John Brown was captured and executed by one Robert E. Lee, leading a contingent of United, United States Army contingent that retook Harper's Ferry, captured John Brown, and his, a couple of his sons were involved, along with some of his followers. And John Brown, of course, was executed. As John Brown came north <clears throat> on a train, one of the train stops was here in Rutland. And at the present uh, Berwick House, or uh, Bradwell House, I'm sorry, on the corner of Merchant's Row and Washington Street, John Brown's body lie in state in the lobby before put back on a train and taken over to his current uh, burial place in upstate New York, traveled on the Rutland Railroad. John Brown, one of the great champions of, if you will, freeing and eliminating slavery. And we come into our own modern times. Thurgood Marshall, probably one of the top lawyers in the country, he was the one that argued the Brown versus the Board of Education uh, decision before the Supreme Court. That is the one that opened, ended segregation in public schools. And it came to a head, really, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And you know the story there where the governor of Arkansas said that wasn't going to happen. President Eisenhower federalized the National Guard in Little Rock and little African-American children were escorted into school. And believe me, the first ones that went there, they didn't have it easy. They had a tough time. And they were small children being taunted and harassed by adults who should have known better. But they were the first. And they had the courage and the backbone to follow through. It must have been awful difficult for these little kids, especially to go home at night and tell their parents the way they were treated by their fellow students. 
But every good turn has to have a beginning. And it began with Brown versus the Board of Education. And of course, as you know, it followed up. For example, Alabama during the Kennedy administration, when George Wallace stood in the symbolic door at the University of Alabama and said, segregation now, segregation forever. Well, <clears throat> President Kennedy did the same thing that Eisenhower did in Arkansas. He federalized the Alabama National Guard, and George got escorted away from the door. And of course, we look at the, the situation now. Many of these black athletes that are starring in college sports in the South, especially the Southeast Football Conference, I wonder if they ever stopped to look back at the ones that opened the door for them. Every, every day, these people should be their champions. And here in the month of February, as we commemorate black history, and we look at the great black leaders, Thurgood Marshall has to be one of the greatest. I don't think he gets the proper recognition that he should. Thurgood Marshall became an advisor both to Presidents Kennedy, President Johnson, and he was appointed by President Johnson to the U.S. Supreme Court, the first African American to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. Martin Luther King, a great American. Unfortunately, he had an untimely death being assassinated. Martin Luther King took tremendous abuse, and yet he remained firm. And he was not a violent man, although he had violence inflicted upon him. And he led the civil rights movement. And of course today, this is still an ongoing, ongoing project. The question of slavery in the United States is settled. The question of equal rights this is still something that this country is still contending with and still battling with. But eventually, as we move on, as other generations come, it's going to take time, but we're going to see these problems solved and solved in a favorable way. So the ideals that we were built on and that we, were, we are a long way from achieving we will achieve eventually. It's unfortunate that it's taken so much time, and there have been setbacks. And one of the setbacks we have is occurring right now with the current administration. We have a, a racist in the White House. We've seen a revival of the Ku Klux Klan under this administration. We've seen a revival of the neo-Nazis. When a group of people Many, many people get together and they raise their right hand, similar to uh, the German salute to Adolf Hitler. Instead of saying, Hail Hitler, they're saying, Hail Trump. We are on the verge. And when an individual occupying the White House says, I am the chief law enforcement officer in the land, I can do anything I want. We are in trouble, folks. We are in big trouble. But we have the opportunity to remedy that situation. And hopefully we will have the intelligence to do it. Now speaking of that, as you know, next week is town meeting day here in Vermont. It's also what we call Super Tuesday. We're going to be one of the 14 states that are having our presidential primary. So if you're voting absentee or when you go to the polls, whatever, they're going to ask you, if you want to vote in the primary, what primary do you want to vote in? And you'll get either a Republican ballot or a Democratic ballot. We're also, of course, electing our local officers, and passing our local budgets. There are also going to be, in every town, a number of, of other items that are going to be paid for over and above the approved local budget. 
Now, as most of you will notice, the biggest item in your local budget is going to be your school budget. And here in the city, it is by far our largest budget. 58 mil for the school compared to 22 for the, for the municipal budget. But one of the things that uh, we're going to see on the ballot throughout Rutland County, in some places it will be voted on from the floor, in other cases it's going to take a ballot. And that is something I have a special interest in, and that is the Marble Valley Regional Transit District. And the reason I have a special interest in it is because, number one, I represent the city of Rutland on the Board of Commissioners of the Rapid Trans Rutland, Rutland Regional Rapid Transit District. I'm also the vice chair of that committee. I am the former treasurer. So I sort of have an uh, interest in how the bus does on, on the local ballot. So I'd like to put out a little bit of information right now. For the month of January, uh, the bus, of course, as you know, it not only serves the city of Rutland, it serves the county of Rutland. We go over to Fairhaven, go over to Poultney. We have a run going up through Brandon that connects on with the Addison uh, Public Transit on the way to Middlebury. We also provide transportation down into Ludlow to Okemo. And also there's a connector that goes down to Manchester that connects with the public transit out of Bennington. Well, what we, what we serve, for example, is Killington, Fairhaven, Manchester, Ludlow, Proctor, Middlebury. Um, we run a special service at Killington called, which services the community of Killington, which as you know, has grown and it continues to grow. Killington Vale, Killington Village, the uh, ski school up there, and the Mountain Green. Well, the month of January, the bus transported 88,019 people altogether. Our fiscal year, which runs from July 1 to June 30th, and we don't have the uh, totals for fiscal year 2020 yet, but for 2019, the bus revenue was 7.1 million. And what we paid out was 7.9 million. So almost, but not quite, an even balance. The bus is under a 10-year contract at the parking deck in Rutland. And we rent that space from the state of Vermont. In other words, we have a, a office and we have spaces to park the buses when they come in to let passengers off and pick up others. And we're under a 10-year contract that will run until uh, the year uh, 20, uh, 2022. It went into effect in, in 2012. So 10-year contract, 2022. And we pay rental of the state of $20,241 a year. Um, in fiscal year 2019, we transported 803,744 passengers. Total mileage, 1,034,183 miles. In Rutland City, the routes we have serving Rutland City, there's the hospital route, the north route, which is our uh, most travel route in the city for some reason, the south route, the south extension route, and the west route. In the month of January, hospital route 4,000, the north route 8,000, south route 4,000, south extension 3,000, and the west route is 5,000, and that's just within the city of Rutland. So that will be one of the things that you're going to see on your ballot in town meeting day. And the greatest thing that we can do in this country, the thing that's going to make democracy going, is to get involved. We have nine people running for the Board of Aldermen this year in Rutland City, which is good. It's good. But get out and vote. It's the greatest privilege we have in this country. We control our government. We have the right to vote.
please take advantage of that on town meeting day. With that, we bring this show to a conclusion. May Almighty God and His infinite wisdom continue to bless these United States of America. Have a great week and vote.